become interested in gerontology? Well, it really was a kind of a process. I started off my earlier career working for Child and Family Services in the state of Georgia. Uh, I did child abuse investigations, and um, it was rewarding work, but it was, um, it, it took a lot out of me because I kept seeing the same children come back through the system. Uh, you know, you would try to put safety plans in place to make sure t that something bad wouldn't happen to the child, and a judge might put the child back in the home where the abuse had occurred and there was nothing you could do about it. And uh, the lack of resources um, in rural Georgia for families, whether it be counseling or whatever, was, was something that really was disheartening. Um, but also working with a population of people that I was mandated to work for and work with, uh, the majority of which did not want to be working with me because I'm the, the mean welfare lady knocking on the door that might take the children away. Um, it was really hard to work and engage with people who didn't want to be working with you. And I saw a lot of my coworkers um, had been in the field for a long, long time, had ceased being effective working with the families that they were working with because they were so burned out. And when I found that I was starting to have some of those same feelings, uh, feeling that I wasn't really making a difference and that people didn't want me working with them, which they didn't. Uh, I started looking at something different that I could do uh, where I could use my social work type skills and my background in psychology to engage with people and offer them hope and support, but that they would be people that would want to be receptive to it. So I, I just was looking one day and in the paper I saw an ad for the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving. That was 18 years ago. Um, and it was about an hour and a half away from where I lived. Mm -hmm. But I decided to, and it was a part-time position. But I thought, well, I, I want to find out what this is all about. I had never heard of the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving. So I drove, went to my interview, Dr. Jack Nottingham, who was the uh, executive director of the Institute at the time, and his deputy director, Dr. David Hagler, interviewed me and asked me more questions than I had ever been asked in an interview. And I was just certain that I had really flubbed the entire thing. <laughs> and um, uh, but very probing questions, trying to get at the heart of what type of person I was and what types of things I wanted to be doing with my life. And so I was very surprised when a couple of days later I got the call that, and they offered me the position. When I first came there, I was 19 hours a week because if I had been 20, they would have to pay benefits. And so I was under a Robert Wood Johnson funded grant uh, and I would be doing things to help support caregivers in the state of Georgia. And so I really, sort of dove into immersing myself in what that meant. And uh, the Institute had been there uh, for a, a number of years already at that time and had some programs in place to support caregivers. The first one that they had developed is called Caring For You, Caring For Me. And so I shadowed the deputy director and went to some senior centers and watched him present the program as I was learning how to become a presenter myself. And just seeing what a little bit of knowledge and support could do in these people's lives was really energizing for me. It, it excited me to see that uh, there are things that you can do with people and, and it will have an immediate benefit to you as the provider of that service, but also to see the faces of the people that you're impacting. So um, I, uh, I remember the first time that I had to lead one of the Caring For You, Caring For Me's by myself without Dr. Hagler being there. And it was at a large church in Columbus, Georgia who was very forward thinking in that, uh, and it's a five week program, two hours a night uh, for five weeks in a row. They had a respite daycare program for uh, caregivers of, of people with Alzheimer's disease. So they offered to have the people in the respite period at night so that the caregivers would be free to come and, and go to the support group that I was leading. And uh, we know a lot of people won't leave their home and go to things that would be beneficial to them because they have nobody else to leave their person with. So that really was, was a great idea. And uh, the first time that I led a, a program, the entire five weeks, I just, it, it, it just was something I felt like I had been called to do. And, uh, and so I continued working with uh, the Rosen Carter Institute for the next few years. Uh, I actually, there was a very brief period when my grant ran out and, uh, and I did some side work with a, a local hospice, um, some contract work, because I had been told as soon as we get another grant, we're gonna bring you back. We want you back, we think you're part of the team. And so uh, maybe two months was, was not there and they got some funding and, uh, and I was brought back 
and just uh, it, it was just sort of the way that things fell out. I actually was hired to be technical assistance for a new program that we were doing, uh, funded by Johnson and Johnson. Uh, it was a signature program in caregiving, and it was through their corporate uh, philanthropy arm, not through their consumer products. And they had some other programs in the country uh, with Dartmouth and John Hopkins, uh, some other signature programs. But they really wanted to do something around caregiving because they have a credo at Johnson & Johnson, uh, part of which is to give back to the communities in which our employees live and work. And they saw that caregiving was something that affected all of their employees, no matter where they were in the country or overseas. And so uh, they, luckily for us, saw that Rosalind Carter was the face of, of the movement to support caregivers in our country. And uh, so they approached us with a proposal uh, and I was hired back. But I was hired back as uh, technical assistance. And then I, uh, I guess it might have been six months before they brought in a director of that partnership program. And so I worked for her, but I also had learned so much and was like training the person that was gonna be my boss, which was an interesting dynamic. But she was wonderful, Dr. Robin Rosenthal. And uh, I learned a lot from her. And when she left and decided to move on to something else, I had already been there a while and uh, they decided to give me a go at it. So I took a big jump from being a person sort of at this level to the director of national initiatives for the Rosalind Carter Institute. And uh, that was a, a big leap of faith on their part. Mm -hmm. I'm very glad that they took it. And um, in the midst of all of this though, caregiving really struck home for me. Uh, my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. Uh, he had been retired from the Federal Aviation Administration, one of the smartest men that, that you would ever want to meet, sweet, loving, caring person, and, um, but here I was working at a caregiving institute, so I thought that that would help prepare me and help me be able to support my mother. Uh, I, and I have two sisters who are both nurses, so we thought we had the caregiving bases all covered, uh, but I learned very quickly that when it's your own family, a lot of the things that you know and have learned go out the window and it was very difficult uh, and, and he, uh, he died December two years ago uh, from the disease. But then I really got more impassioned with the need to support caregivers. About that time is when we got funding uh, to bring the REACH program, Resources for Enhancing Alzheimer Caregiver Health, had been a huge randomized control trial done around the country in several locations uh, that had received big funding from uh, NINR and, and other you know, big funders of such types of research. And what we found was uh, when we talked to the principal investigators, uh, Dr. Laura Gitlin, uh, for one, uh, Mary Middleman wasn't involved in that program, but she has the New York University Caregiver Intervention. We talked to a lot of the people that had developed in clinical trials programs to support caregivers but they were in the research world and they had developed them. The programs had uh, proven positive outcomes for caregivers, but they didn't necessarily know how to take it off the shelf and into practice in the communities where the caregivers were and that could be positively impacted by the program. So we're like, aha, we're onto something here. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we uh, began working with the developers of the programs and uh, we uh, became trained as master trainers in several of the programs, REACH is one. And, um, and then we started being able to uh, uh, make the case to our major funder to do pilot projects around the country. So we do the training, the certification of staff at the sites and ongoing technical assistance uh, to help move it like I said, in, and so we partnered with the community agencies. The agencies bring the program to their own local folks, so it's not us doing it. And it's definitely not the researchers doing it because they didn't work for small community-based organizations that work with caregivers, mostly uh, AAAs, area agencies on aging and the like. And, uh, and so uh, what I was learning in my personal journey with my father's disease and the impact it was having, especially on my mother, um, just made me realize how, how the need for ongoing uh, support to caregivers, but support that was grounded in evidence to start off with. Because uh, when we first started doing the work at RCI, we weren't looking necessarily at things being evidence-based. And there were a lot of things out there that sounded good, and you'd have anecdotal um, feedback from the caregiver that it helped them, but you had no data. 
And so uh, I think that we were one of the first organizations to realize that if you're going to get funding for things, you've got to be able to have data. You've got mm -hmm. to prove that caregiver depression goes down, that caregiver burden goes down, satisfaction with life goes up. And, and so we, we got real serious in, in partnering with the, those researchers. And um, as I said, Dr. Gitlin and, and uh, Dr. Middleman were just a couple. Uh, Dr. Linda Nichols with the Memphis VA uh, had been part of that original REACH uh, program, but there were all of these people and every single researcher that we talked with and partnered with, uh, the reason they had gotten into the research end of it was someone in their family had Alzheimer's disease and they wanted to do something to help. So it was just the way things came together and I was just fortunate, I think, to be in the right place at the right time. And um, uh, of course, the, my biggest influence after I came to the Rosalind Carter Institute was Rosalind Carter herself, who was such a, a positive role model in successful aging. Uh, President Carter is 90 now, Rosalind is 87. They keep a schedule uh, that I don't think I could keep at my age, uh, but but just r really, you know, her uh, her wanting and, and needing to, to give something back to caregivers. She had been thrust in the caregiving role at an early age herself. Her mother, after her father died, uh, and he was young when he died, he had leukemia, uh, had to go to work for the first time and support the family. So Rosalind was left at home with the younger siblings to take care of them. So she, she learned, she got a real quick dose of what family caregiving was like. And she knew that caregivers needed support. Almost everybody wants to stay in their own home for as long as they can. They don't want to go to a nursing home or, or some other type of place. They want to be at home. And she knew that the best way to ensure they could stay in their own home longer would be to support that family member because the family member is the person that's providing the lion's share of support. You have all these other clinical type people that are working with the person that has an illness or a disability, but the caregiver needs support too. So. That was a very long answer to that question. But that fantastic. <laughs> uh, you spoke a little bit of your uh, career path, but would you mind describing your career trajectory as a gerontologist a little bit further? Well, like I said, it, it was just a series of events that sort of uh, came into play by uh, fate or whatever you want to call it. Um, I, uh, I think that once I saw that this was such a huge need after, when I first came to the Rosen Carter Institute, that made me want to do more. Mm -hmm. Then I went on and I got my certificate in, in gerontology at that point. Uh, I think I had been at the Rosen Carter Institute probably two years when I decided to go for that. Um, have become more and more of an advocate too. So uh, I'm now uh, one of the things I really love doing is making visits to Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. I was in D.C. in February and helping educate uh, senators and congressmen on the need for more supports for family caregivers, more funding for f the National Family Caregiver Support Program monies, more um, funding for respite. We know how important that is for caregivers uh, and, and seeing that it really does make a difference when you have personal stories that you can tell and when you go and talk to a senator or congressman. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I have found in doing so that they had someone in their family, maybe their mother, who had Alzheimer's disease and so it really struck home. Um, so, you know, getting things to change, getting laws to change and getting uh, increased enhanced supports for people in the caregiving role. It's the data is important because you've got to show that, you know, this cost pennies per day uh, compared to the $6,000 a month, say, that it costs to have a person institutionalized. And if you can keep them at home, and we track data such as that, if you can keep them in their own home for 6, 12, 18 months for a, a very tiny amount of money, uh, versus the huge amount of money it is to be somewhere else, then you know they, they look at that, but you also have to connect to them on that personal level for them to really get vested in wanting to put their time and energy behind something. So uh, uh, I, I have sort of started gravitating towards, uh, and I'm considering going back to school for the PhD. Uh, I have a master's in public administration, but I'm seeing now that maybe a uh, a PhD in public policy would be a natural thing. Um, I initially thought I'm too old at 58 to go back to school, but I see a lot of other people doing it and a lot of women that have, have done it, including my boss, who, uh, who got her PhD uh, in uh, nursing. So I think that I need to continue to learn how I can make a difference. 
and at the point in my career when I retire, I still want to be the person that's going up and knocking on doors and stating a case for things because this is something that's not going to go away. Uh, the people that are uh, in the caregiving role, are, that's just going to grow and grow and grow because people are living longer and they're staying in their own homes for longer periods of time and that person that's that main source of support for them is in it for a very long period of time. So that, that that need for support and for funding for support that's based in evidence for family caregivers is only going to increase. It's never going to decrease. And, uh, and so uh, another thing that I do that I didn't mention, and this is just sort of uh, came with the turf, I guess, but we have a caregiving certificate program now at the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving. And it's not just for uh, nursing majors and psychology and sociology majors and, and young students, but it's geared at the mid-level professionals who are already in the field uh, who are wanting more background and information on caregiving. It's an 18-hour uh, certificate. It's a standalone certificate, so you can take it. Uh, there's no out-of-state tuition or anything like that. The courses are all provided online, and uh, I would say probably 50 or 60 percent of the people that take the courses uh, are people already in the field, mid-level mid type folks, non-traditional students. I teach four of the classes out of the six, and uh, so have really uh, uh, been excited to see that, you know, molding the future caregivers of tomorrow, giving them skills and understanding the evidence base that's out there around supporting caregivers. Uh, one of the courses I teach is on um, uh, special populations, and one special population that we're supporting now through our work at the Rosen Carter Institute is military caregivers. And so I teach an entire course on that. You know, these are uh, a new cadre of caregivers that uh, traditionally haven't gotten support. And so we now have an evidence-based program for, for that population of caregivers. Um, I'm teaching this semester caregiving at the end of life. And that has been very rewarding, but also difficult because it brings back a lot of memories of my father being at the end of his life. But uh, getting students, whether they're the young 20-year-old fresh-faced students or the 40, 50-year-old students, to understand the things that can be put into place and the, the strides that have been made in palliative care and hospice care and how that's not a sign of defeat to finally say, well, it's time to bring hospice in. No, they can do so much to enhance the quality of life for the person that's dying, but also the caregivers, the other people that are in the family. And, uh, and so uh, I absolutely, in case you can't tell, love my job. It's helped me so much personally, but also knowing that you're making a difference in the lives of other people because uh, there, there's a famous quote that Mrs. Carter says all the time, and I'm sure I'm going to get it wrong, but there are only four types of people in the world. Those who are caregivers, those have, who have been caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. And that's everybody. So caregiving is going to touch your life. Uh, if it hasn't now, it will at some point in the future. Whether you want it to or not, you're going to be faced with, with dealing with uh, being in the role of a caregiver. And so knowing that I'm doing things and helping promote uptake of programs that support people who are in that caregiving role is very, very rewarding to me. Fantastic. At what point in your career did you embrace the gerontologist title? Uh, I guess uh, probably a couple of years after I had gone to work for the Rosen Carter Institute for Caregiving um, and, and really started immersing myself in this field of support for caregivers. Um, that, again, that's why I went and, and got the certificate in gerontology um, and, and seeing that um, there, were, there were so many issues in the field that, you know, even from randomized uh, trials that are done with medications, uh, traditionally being done with people who were younger and not being tested on people that were older and the side effects could be different for people that are older than they were for the people that, that were initially tested on and uh, the need that there be more physicians, nurses, social workers that are trained in the needs of an aging population because their needs are different. You know, my needs are different than they were when I was your age and, uh, and will continue to change and you need professionals that are being trained in understanding what those changes are so that they can provide the proper level of support and care to you and, uh, and just really saw that this was a field that was going to continue to grow uh, and that there needed to be a lot more people drawn to that field and, uh, and so I, it, again it's just a part of the job it just sort of unfolded. 
Did you have any female mentors that really impacted you to go into gerontology? Well, again, some of the people that I met early on and, and talked with and worked with, uh, Mrs. Carter, obviously, um, my sisters who are both nurses, uh, my sister Fran is a hospice nurse. Mm -hmm. and, and so the role that she's had and, and being able to talk to me about uh, how impactful of a, of a position it can be to be helping families go through that end of life period of time in the most positive way possible and that it's not something to be feared uh, but but something that you can embrace and and, uh, and help a family to heal and, and get through in, in a positive way uh, so my sister Fran definitely a mentor uh, the researchers uh, such as Dr. Laura Gitlin uh, Dr. Linda Nichols Dr. Mary Middleman uh, and others those my uh, those are just coming to my the forefront of my mind sitting and uh, when I first went up to them it's this is interesting um, when we started looking at the need to be doing programs that were evidence-based so did a lit review and found out that there were 60 plus programs to support family caregivers that had been developed in clinical trials none of which except for REACH had even been taken off the shelf though they were still sitting on the shelf and so I go to a lot of aging conferences and so I would get the program and I, would, I went through there and I looked for sessions where these people were speaking and I went to their sessions and then hung around afterwards and timidly went up and introduced myself and told them uh, about the Rosen Carter Institute for Caregiving and, and what we were looking to do and every single one of them was so open to talking to me, to telling me about their personal experience, what had gotten them into the field, and um, and even though I didn't have the level of expertise that they had or the research background that they had, uh, their openness and wanting to share with me and partner with us uh, was huge, mm -hmm. you know. And to be quite honest with you, I was so intimidated to even go up to them. Uh, and, and Dr. Kate Lorg is another one at uh, Stanford uh, who developed the chronic disease self-management program, um, that none of them were unapproachable, none of them were uh, people that wouldn't take time out to talk to somebody else about the field and the needs of the field. And so they all had really quite an impact on me and continue to have an impact on me today. Fantastic. Uh, what do you feel is unique about being a female gerontologist? My what? about being a female gerontologist, what's unique about that? What's unique about it? Um, well, actually, I think what's a, a positive thing about it is that, and you know, it's, it's changed slightly, but not, not that much over the years, that women have always traditionally been the majority of the people who are in the caregiving role. Uh, you know, men are starting to step up a little bit, but uh, back at the, you know, beginning of, of time before they were ever called caregivers, um, you know, uh, women would travel to neighboring villages and communities to help deliver babies of people. You know, they were in that role. Uh, they were taking care of anybody sick in the family uh, and have, have always been in that role. And, uh, and I think that there's a certain level of empathy that, uh, not saying anything negative about the men, but, but women have, have an innate, I think, sense of empathy and caring in them that enables them to do the work. But um, also the, the more um, unpleasant aspects of caregiving uh, from, the, from the women I know. Uh, we, aren't, we don't shy away from the, the bedpan. We don't shy away from the having to put uh, dad in the bathtub and all of those types of things that uh, I think really women, like I said, it, it, whether it's part of our genetics or part of just our upbringings, uh, but, but we, we have those skills and we have that degree of understanding that I think makes it easier for us to reach out and provide care to others and also help others embrace the role, including men, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to reach out and do those things that, that are uncomfortable, things that nobody really wants to do. But um, I, I think that's what makes being in the field as a woman unique because we, we have personal aspects we bring to it as well as our professional, our education and our experiences in the field and, uh, and research that we're, that we're involved in. So I, I guess that's it. How has being a gerontologist um, interacted with your own personal aging? Oh, that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. um, well, I know for a fact that seeing all the, uh, the, the women in the field, um, especially who have done such tremendous work and are 
maybe 20 years senior of me and are still doing it. And even at this conference, you know, you see a lot of people that are so engaged and they're still giving. Uh, again, going back to, to Rosalind Carter, uh, you know, having a, per, a sense of purpose, I think, uh, keeps a person young. Uh, and so you can call it active aging or whatever you want to call it. But uh, I don't fear aging. I know that I've done a lot that has had a positive impact, but I know I have a lot left to give. And, uh, and it's very uh, encouraging to see others in the field that are continuing with their work, continuing to do that research, continuing to, uh, to impact the field. Uh, so it gives me hope mm -hmm. that uh, for as long as I can walk and talk and, and, uh, uh, you know, and even if I can't do some of those things, I can you know, do things on my computer or my iPad. Um, just to know that there, there's still a lot left that I can do, which is one of the reasons why I'm seriously contemplating going back to school at my age, because I, I you know, uh, people live a long time in my family, and, mm -hmm. and so I, I may still have another 20 or so years that I could really be doing something positive, so why not mm -hmm. uh, get some more education and training so that I can do an even better job? Mm -hmm. So it's uh, definitely, I don't think I'm, I'm too old to make visits on Capitol Hill. I quite enjoy doing that type of thing. And, uh, and you know, influencing policy, uh, getting people to understand the need to support caregivers uh, across the lifespan. Uh, I, I think that that's going to uh, keep me young to mm -hmm. know that I still have something to offer. Mm -hmm. So the WIPA project focuses on the legacies of older gerontologists. And within that framework, is there anything else you would like to let us know? Basically? Uh, just that um, I'm 18 years into this journey at the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving. I, I think I still have some things to do and, uh, and hope that, um, that I will leave a very positive legacy in the, in the way that I've helped roll programs out nationally, uh, the REACH program and now Operation Family Caregiver for military caregivers. Um, that's, uh, I think, going to continue to expand. And so um, knowing that I'm having an impact not just in my neck of the woods down in rural southwest Georgia, but that I'm uh, helping other people learn the skills that they need to support the caregivers in their locations around the country, um, that's, I, I think, something to look forward to having a po positive legacy in. Mm 